this episode of Shaping the Future, I'm talking to Professor Wolfgang Knorr, a climate scientist with over 25 years working for many agencies and laboratories around the world. Currently, Wolfgang is a senior research scientist at Lund University, measuring CO2 fluxes from terrestrial vegetation and human activities, among other things. This conversation is to discuss the concerns that he and his colleagues have about the use or misuse of the term net zero, and their concern that collectively we are setting ourselves up for failure in tackling the climate crisis. The safest pathway to the future means radical transformation of our societies, and yet the net zero narrative is one of incremental changes and technology that does not exist. In this critical moment when we are expected to do what is necessary, instead collectively we have chosen to ignore the risks and lock in for longer a business as usual approach. A link to the co-written article we refer to in this interview is linked to in the notes and is addressed to climate scientists with the adage, concept of net zero is a dangerous trap. Thank you for listening to Shaping the Future. There are many more episodes coming. Please do subscribe on any major podcast channel to hear more. Wolfgang, thank you very much for joining me today. I just want to start because we're talking about your recent publication in Conversation and around net zero. Can we start by establishing a definition of net zero? Because for many people, it's got this sort of conflicting ideas of what it actually means. No, it's, that, that's actually the key question here. And there are sort of different things that go into this, into net zero. And the starting point to explain it, I guess, is, is the science. And the science says quite clearly that in order to stabilize the climate, any sources and sinks have to be balanced in the end. That's very, very simple. That's what nature does in a way. And we have to do that too. And we haven't done it for a long time. So in that sense, uh, net zero is, is very simple, but it, it also has a kind of a mathematical angle to it. Is Net zero also means that whatever the plus, when I have the minus, it, it comes out zero. So it's one minus one is zero, but a million minus million is also zero. And net zero sort of in, in pure mathematical scientific terms basically means uh, balance out carbon sources and, and, and sinks. But uh, what we were aiming at more is the kind of connotation it has achieved through the net zero promises that we've been seeing, net zero by 2050 and then debates about maybe it should be earlier and China coming in net zero by 2060 and in the end it has to be the entire globe going net zero. But the thing is that originally, and uh, I co-published a paper back in 2008 about this, originally it wasn't called net zero, it was simply that uh, we have basically go towards zero and then if there are some emissions left, some residual emissions, they should be balanced out. Now, because of the kind of the mathematics of plus minus, net zero has this ring that, okay, we can go quite high with our emissions. We just need to come up with ways of balancing it out. So it's a bit like this one minus one or million minus million is it's because currently it's it's very very difficult to stay within the carbon budget that scientific community has come up with that we can still emit from industrial activities and so on it is very likely that we will be far above that so we can then think of technologies that are often in the future and don't really exist to balance that out but if you look at the failed climate policy efforts to date. Isn't this net zero concept, if you like, the only viable way forward for stabilizing the climate? Do we have any other options? I think we shouldn't call it, I agree, but we shouldn't call it net zero because of that connotation of giving license to high rates of emission. The goal should be zero. And then what we can't meet, then there should be compensation. What should be the final way out, the just the final finishing touch on a climate policy has now become the first thing we do. The first thing we put out there is net, the net zero. But we should actually go to, to zero and then at the end, when there's no other option, we have sort of, you know, for example, emissions from agriculture or things like that, that are absolutely vital. We will have to come up with ways of compensating them. That's absolutely fine. But by coming up with net zero, 
from the very, very beginning. I mean, we have seen promises, but we haven't seen discussions about today, tomorrow, how to address the climate crisis. We haven't had discussions about no private cars, necessary traveling, about uh, insulating our homes, not in 20 years time, but like this year or in, in a few months or whatever. We haven't had that. So by going net zero right now here, the term has such a strong connotation of delay, in my view, that it shouldn't be used anymore. But so what you're saying is that the term itself is concealing almost non-efforts, if you like. It's allowing too many, too many people not to do things. Is that right? Exactly. It's a, it, it's a promise of future technologies saving us that either don't exist or can be quite dangerous, as, for example, by energy and carbon capture and storage. I'm just thinking that, you know, this is 2021 and many scientists say that you know, we have to sort this problem out now in this decade. You know, it has to, whatever happens, we have to do it now. And if we're setting off with, on a journey with net zero and it's potentially not actually going to get us anywhere close to where we need to be, are we saying that the, there is damage already done? You know, we're kind of already setting off on the wrong path. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the framing we, you just said, I mean, this, this is the last chance. I mean, we, we've had that until the, at least the 1990s, I would say. I was just reminded of Helmut Kohl's COP1 speech, and you could just pass it on to Boris Johnson. I mean, it would, it's just copy-paste, I and mean, we've seen it all. We need something new. We need some new, new ideas, really, and they can't be old recipes. And net zero is just not that i'm afraid isn't there a sort of inevitability about where we are now in terms of the climate goals that have been sort of evolving out of the cop system which itself is kind of a stop stop start negotiation it doesn't seem to accomplish too much isn't there an inevitability of where we are now at 2021 where actually climate impacts are becoming more tangible. People are seeing them and getting very worried. So there's more public on board. There's more anxiety. And yet we, we're just starting to get the proper lip service we need. And it just happens to fall into this net zero narrative. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. I mean, what a game changer has been, um, very simply, what you just said, that in 2000, the scientists have been able to detect the warming signal the first time about 2000 and uh, since then you know record temperatures have just become so commonplace that kind of everybody knows it now and that changes the story of course and then came you know extinction rebellion with the youth movement all of these these kind of things they, they kind of came together and the answer for the policy system or in my view actually the science and the policy in the politician political system has been to ratchet up the ambition, but the ambition being far in the future. So there has been a very well organized concerted effort to, you know, to address these growing fears, but it's entirely in the bubble, in the announcement space, in the academic discussions, and within climate science, it's, it's within computer models, really. I mean, it, that's where the action is. It's, it's just, it's virtual. A lot of people have a great deal invested in this net zero trajectory, if you like. But you believe it's a trap. Can you sort of say why you think it's a trap? Yeah, that's right. Within the writing team, I was the one who was first in favour of being, <laughs> putting it in. And one of the reasons is that for a long time I've been feeling, do I actually wish for net zero to happen or not? And I wasn't sure. For one, and the, the promise of net zero, if it fails, and it, it looks like, it's going to fail. Basically, it means we will have uncontrolled warming, which is bad. But it not failing could just be as disastrous because so far the only pilot project that I know of in, in th these kind of technologies that, that are being discussed, and I'm not talking about planting trees because that's limited in time. Once the trees grown, then there's no uptake, and they can actually um, be wiped out by climate change itself. 
So <laughs> this technology that is called bioenergy and carbon capture and storage. The idea is planting bioenergy crops. They could be trees, but they could also be dedicated bioenergy crops. Burning them and then catching the CO2 and then pumping it to ge geological storage. The entire geological storage part has been under discussion for many, many years and nothing's happened really. But that's the only part of the story. But anyway, this is the only technology that is really on the table. And Drax power station, they're just piloting that. However, Drax burns more trees than the UK grows. They all import from North America. It's one power station. And already we're seeing a sizable increase in deforestation in Europe. In the EU, I mean, the UK imports most of the wood. The EU does have its own supply. And there are already now where this is just a drop in the ocean, what we have so far in, in terms of bioenergy and in addressing climate change. Already now we're seeing clear cutting in Estonian nature reserves in order to provide power stations with wood chips. And we also know that wood chips generate less energy per unit of weight than coal, for example. They take energy and, and fossil fuel emissions actually to produce and all transport and all that. We're already seeing the damage and it hasn't even started. If it was actually successful in these astronomical amounts of CO2 uptake that would be needed for that kind of climate policy, I mean, we would have no natural ecosystems left, that's clear. And there would be massive competition with land for food. There would be problems with water resources, all sorts. If it's possible, it would be catastrophic. And if it's not possible, it would also be catastrophic. So that's the trap. And one of the problems here is, is that we're all involved in this. We, we're all consuming the energy, we're all consuming the products, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. And yet we all have a, a lot of skin in the game in, in the outcome. And what is an answer that would give us the outcome that, that we actually need? We blame policymakers, but really we're often very complicit in our life choices. Yeah, I mean, um, we scientists are complicit in coming up with stories in which climate policy is successful in the eyes of the public. And as consumers, uh, we're also complicit, well, most of us in the rich world. And it doesn't work if we just say, okay, I'm going to get rid of my car. You could go very, you know, low carb footprint yourself and we'll just still not change anything. I think what is really needed is more awareness of the scale of the problem by the population at large. And we are protecting the, the population at large from the, as scientists, of coming up with these fancy solutions. And then we need political buy-in. The only way to change things is our political decisions that are based on the entire population. It's kind of radical democracy. To me, that's the only way. I mean, there, there, are, you know, it's. I know it's, a, it's a long way to get there. I mean, I'm, I'm not optimistic, <laughs> but it's, it's the only way I can see. <laughs> well, I think we're going the wrong way in the UK at the moment. Then, <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've just touched on the role of climate scientists, and quite often, climate scientists don't agree. How do you see the role of climate scientists in this, in terms of communicating with the public and policy makers and doing their work and have you got a view on that yeah I, mean, I think it's it's very important to me that climate science should just get rid of the idea that they should be kind of neutral value neutral or something like that because i mean it's, it's, it's very simple anyway it's, it's it's impossible to do that you cannot not have kind of an implicit message which is ethical in a way or political whatever you do. So I, 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 my peers to climate scientists just get rid of that old fashioned idea. <laughs> Another reason is that it's very difficult to grasp how dangerous climate change really is. I, I'm actually grappling with that as a scientist. It's not clear. And the division of labor between scientists and politicians, where basically scientists provide the information and, and then it's up to the politician who actually to judge how dangerous the thing is really is, and then make judgments, okay, how do I prioritize on all that, is completely flawed because the scientist who spends so much time with this topic is the only one who can actually get kind of an integrated view of this. 
But unfortunately, we scientists often don't do it. We see the trees, but we don't see the forest. We're trained to specialize. And I think the role of scientists should really be to step out of their specialty, engage with the public, and then as part of that engagement, be helped to get a better grasp of the bigger picture. Because I think we as scientists can't do that on our own. I think we need the dialogue with the public. And this is also, it's not just about the facts, it's also about the fears and the, you know, and the hopes. And it's more about the emotional part. And this is actually what we try to get across with the article. We're talking about our own failures, our cowardice, for example, we're not speaking out that something is wrong with this ludicrously optimistic scenarios that we're putting there, not saying anything. You allude to the fact that we're moving in the direction of geoengineering and in particular solar geoengineering, at least research into it. Yeah. And from what I can tell, the models seem to suggest that it works. Is that in a way the ultimate failure or is that the next best thing? I mean, what are your thoughts on that direction where we, where we do seem to be heading? Well, it's the logic, uh, unless we can now disrupt the story, it's not anymore about now doing something about climate change, it's, it's now about d- disrupting the story of using science as a justification of delay. Then we're going to end up there, and I'm a modeler, I've developed something like about five or six models, and also, <laughs> I'm, in a way, I'm kind of climate skeptic, I'm a climate model skeptic. We should never ever base decisions like that on model results. Well, there is the risk, for example, of creating large scale drought. That's actually on the table. That's been shown as a model of results. Whether that's real or not, we don't know. There is, there's a theory that they actually the Mount Pinatu eruption that was in the 1990s volcano in the Philippines caused the drought in the Sahel. It's, you can't prove it. You would have to repeat the, <laughs> the experiment. But uh, that's on the table. So we can create the impression that it works by just doing the research all the time. It's very subtle, but it's also very effective. And unless scientists are aware of that pitfall, uh, I'm, I'm pessimistic. I, 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 I fear that we, we might end up there. We've got committed climate change from the emissions, which are, you know, it's pretty substantial and there's a lag in the system, all this kind of stuff. We've got what we're still emitting, which just does seem quite criminal, really. And then we've got net zero, which is probably going to fail by, you know, if we going on what we've discussed. Yeah. And then you've got um, the solution of geoengineering which isn't a solution because we don't know what it, what on earth it'll do. It doesn't paint a very aspirational, optimistic view at the moment, does it? I mean, and that's, that's what, that's kind of something we've got to try and grapple with, isn't it? Haven't we got to try and find a route to the future, which is, we can't guarantee it's going to be safe, but it's got to be something. And isn't net zero just simply the best we can do? I mean, I, I personally don't, can't see what that route is at the moment. But. I think we n- need the sobering moment to understand that w- our efforts have failed. We have not been very clever <laughs> what we're doing. We thought we would be, and we haven't. And that can be maybe depressing, but I, I think it can also be liberating. And once we've cleared that, then I personally have no problem with net zero, actually. Once we've actually reflected on our role and on how much we really want to hear that's going to be okay and that we are on a good path and, yeah, it's, you know, um, I mean, you know, we scientists telling that the public and each other and, you know, once we realize that, I personally have no problem with saying, okay, we have to deploy large-scale direct air capture, for example, and massively invest in that. I have no problem, but we need that kind of moment of truth, and very likely we will have to find ways of living with less energy, you know, energy consumption. And that means 
more equitable distribution and think about what is really important you know is do we need that much consumption do we need this and do we need that and i mean it just came across an article about this this new tesla and it has 350 horsepower i mean it's not what we need really <laughs> I mean, I was thinking, I mean, there, there, there are bicycle conversion kits, e-bike conversion kits. You take two of them, weld them together, and you've got the electric vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> we can live with that kind of level of technology. I mean, it's, 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 you don't need to go like... And perhaps, I mean, there are a couple of things, aren't there? Perhaps the transformation of society will come from some aspect of climate catastrophe perhaps it'll come from some sort of famine but perhaps it'll come from a a change of direction from the from the next generation but it's kind of all these things seem to be on a course for change and um, yeah. it's not going the, the radical change that we're looking for is likely to be from an unknown source or maybe a, absolutely um, that's very much this kind of complex system science which tells you like complex system can suddenly collapse and you don't know where it's going to come from. It's like the financial crisis. I mean, it didn't come from sovereign debt. It actually was, came from the housing debt in, in the US first. And then it spread to like the sovereign debt across Europe, which would have been the more obvious candidate. But it came from some kind of a less well-known problem, probably. But that's my guess. I, my guess is that we're going to have a, like a big climate crisis, but we think about terrorism or something. We think it's... Yeah, it's some complete instability in the Middle East or whatever. Or I, we don't know. I mean, I agree. <laughs> it's, it's but it's coming. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I think that's a good place to to, to leave it with this sort of level of uncertainty. But thank you very much for taking the time to speak. To me. Thanks again for listening. If you are interested to help support this series and help expand the discussion around climate topics, then please do consider backing my channel via Patreon. It will help me produce more content and you will also gain access to more expert interviews. It would be great to engage more with audiences too and understand your views on these topics.